Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Judge, and I'm here today with Alex Cannon, a senior here at PC, class of 22 for when this podcast becomes dated. And he did some really interesting research over the summer that we wanted to bring him on and talk about, but he's also done so much other stuff over the last four years. Uh, His research is titled Unfair Negative Portrayals of Nuclear Energy in Pop Culture. And Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I want to start first, before we get into your research, what brought you to PC? Uh, So I was looking at a couple different schools. Uh, I decided on PC actually because of something I think a lot of people, uh, you know, are kind of indifferent towards, but I actually really love the idea of the CIV program. Um, I thought it'd be really cool to kind of see where humanity came from, see where we are now, kind of get that, uh, you know, worldly view and see, um, you know, what's up and where I fit into the, the greater story of things and where things might go as a result. I thought that was really cool. So where where are you from? I'm from East Granby, Connecticut, a little town uh, kind of near Hartford. Okay. All right. I grew up in Milford, which is down near the beach yep. in Connecticut. Very cool. Um, so I came here in 05. I did not come because of the CIV program, so <laughs> yep. we don't have that in common. But uh, you're a theater major. Yes. How did, how did you get into that? So um, I started theater uh, in high school. I had always done band. I'd always done music. And uh, a couple of my friends told me, hey, you should audition for the musical. So I figured it'd be a fun thing to do over the summer. And uh, it was a really fun thing to do over the summer. I ended up loving it so much that uh, I did it all the way out throughout high school. And then when I came here to Providence College, it was also one of the reasons I chose the school is because I really liked the theater program. I'd seen a production of Into the Woods here that I thought was just fantastic. And I was like, I just, I want to be a part of it. So um, I came in and I was just initially a marketing major. And then I was a marketing and theater double major, and now I'm just a theater major, and uh, I'm on the musical theater track, so um, musicals are definitely my thing. What are some of your favorite musicals? Oh, it's a tough question. Beetlejuice is up there. Um, Anyone who's been around me uh, lately has heard me singing from Beetlejuice. Um, I also really love Come From Away, uh, which is a really touching true story about uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which is just so beautiful um and there's a pro shot of it on apple tv plus so anyone who has that i recommend watching it it's amazing amazing show um but my favorite one i was in is something rotten which we did back here in 2019 Uh, i was the minstrel that was like my favorite performance i've ever been in i love that show i want to now kind of direct us towards the research that you did Mm -hmm. but first i want to figure out how does a theater major get connected with a poli-sci professor Mm -hmm. to do this research? So I ended up taking um, Dr. Leota's uh, chemistry in uh, current, what is it? Uh, Chemistry in, I had it written down so I wouldn't forget, but I forgot anyways. (laughs) Chemistry in Contemporary Issues class uh, to fulfill my natural science core requirement. And when we learned about nuclear chemistry, I remember distinctively thinking, man, I thought anything that was radioactive glowed bright green, which is not the case. And I remember thinking, why did I think that? And so I ended up writing my final paper on the subject all about how uh, popular culture in general depicts nuclear things and how, you know, the discrepancies in that with the real science versus the way it's depicted. And uh, Dr. Leota basically said, this paper is really great. I think that you should try and work further on it, maybe get it published. And she connected me with Dr. Guardino, the uh, Associate Professor of Political Science. And um, he and I have been working on the paper. We applied for research grants over the summer, which we were awarded. And uh, I got to work on it. I got to watch a lot of Godzilla, The Simpsons, play some Fallout and Call of Duty, and um, combine that with some extra academic research. And uh, I had a really cool paper to be working on over the summer that uh, is almost done now. Tell me about the grant process and how that worked, because it, it's really interesting at a school like PC where an undergrad in between their junior and senior years can just apply to get some money from the college to put towards this research. How did that go? It went really well. Um, I started off by just looking at the strengths of what I already had in my hands, uh, the final paper that Dr. Leota, you know, saw the potential in and said, hey, you should, you know, take this further. And I looked at that and I, you know, talked with Dr. Gordino and he said, you know, you could really play up the the media studies angle of this and it would probably have a pretty good shot at being published in some of these other academic media studies journals. 
And, um, you know, I was like, sure, let's, let's go for it. So we applied for the research grant, and that was a big part of it. And also saying, um, looking at some of the other uh, current academic, um, you know, research that has been done in this area, which is really next to nothing. And especially in the case of entertainment media, almost literally nothing. And so I think the college saw that, you know, this is kind of an untapped market, I guess, in the uh, field of academic study that it pertains to. And um, they, you know, they jumped on it. They said, yes, we'll award you what you're asking for. And um, you can work on it for a couple weeks over the summer, which stretched into a little more than a couple weeks. But um, it was a great time. I have a blast working on it. And um, it's been a really great experience all the way through, honestly. What did you use those funds for? It's not like this was one of those research projects where you travel or you have to buy lab supplies. This is, this is what's also really great about PC is that you could do a research project that isn't in science or you have to go somewhere. So what did you use those funds for? Yeah, um, some of the funds were initially used for, you know, um, buying some of the movies to watch um, through YouTube and a subscription to Disney Plus to watch The Simpsons, um, ordering the different various video games that I wanted to look at because, you know, in media studies, the, the whole idea is that you watch or play or culminate the entire thing so that you have the same understanding as it as a true fan of the series would. And um, so that was where some of the funds went. Some of the other funds went to basically just, you know, the time that it would take for all this stuff. You know, I got a paid a stipend to work on it. But um, that was pretty much all the funds that I needed, which is also maybe one of the reasons why the college was like, yeah, go for it. Cool. <laughs> we can have a really great paper without, uh, you know, having to pay for too much travel or anything. It would be cool if libraries were able to start renting out video games on consoles because that would be really fun. And mm -hmm. you can get movies and music and books, obviously, digitally from libraries. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's step this up. Come on. Well, yeah, tell me about it. Um, one of the things that I actually focused on in my paper dedicated about a whole page to is really talking about video games and the level of uh, potential impact that they would have. And... A lot of my papers actually spent saying like, hey, you know, I know this is uh, popular entertainment. This is stuff that people would consume anyways, but it has a, a significant potential to influence people. And uh, in that regard, video games, you know, not only have the visual component and the storytelling component, but they also have the, the gameplay and the direct interaction with the player. And um, video games that have more serious story or tones, I think are, you know, when studied academically, uh, have just as much to them as any novel or film or anything else. You know, a well-made video game has all of those components and even an additional component. So, From a straight financial perspective, video games are the largest industry in the entertainment industry as it is. So yeah, it has a huge reach mm -hmm. that is somewhat untapped in a way. It's, um, it's interesting too because video games are moving to a much more affordable uh, way of pricing and uh, just monetization in general because a lot of stuff is free to play now. So as long as you have, you know, the console or whatever, then it is free to play anyway. So why not have libraries be there to make technically everything free yep. to play? The Call of Duties, the War Zones, mm -hmm. yep. uh, the Fortnite, like all exactly. that's free to play. And and then you're talking about like a, a subscription service like Game Pass. Mm -hmm. And for $15 a month, if you don't get the discount that always pops up every so often, you get hundreds of games right on your console. Yeah, perfect. Do you think through pop culture possibly or through other means, will the impression of nucle nuclear energy as a negative mm -hmm. ever recover from the stigma of war and reactor failures and things that have kind of been parodied in entertainment? Sure. Um, that's a great question because I think – to get there, first you have to uh, acknowledge the problem, which is actually one of the things that my paper kind of seeks to unearth, um, at least, you know, for my personal means, because I think what's happened is there's a, a concept of common sense in media studies and pop culture, which is basically, uh, you know, the idea that people take something and internalize it, and it's just a given, something that's taken for granted, the idea that a skunk smells bad or that red means to stop when in a car. And I think that nuclear, as a general term, whether it's referring to the energy or the weaponization, is something that's dangerous, deadly, catastrophic, out of control, and, I know, um, potentially going to cause these horrific mutations. 
And um, until people realize that they have that, um, you know, kind of bias towards nuclear stuff that I think has either been uh, instigated or at least perpetuated by some of this uh, entertainment media, then they're never going to, uh, you know, start coming back the other way and saying like, hey, maybe nuclear is not quite as bad as, you know, it's portrayed to be. Let's talk about some of those examples that have portrayed nuclear in not such a positive light. Mm -hmm. Obviously, The Simpsons is the most popular, and you cover that in your research. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what their impact over the last, it's got it's 30 years now, uh -huh. they've done with uh, Mr. Burns' nuclear plant. <laughs> sure. So uh, The Simpsons has been around for about 30 years. They're at their most popular right when they started, around 1989 into 1990. And the show famously has, you know, Homer Simpson as this bungling idiot, and he's in charge of the nuclear plant's safety inspection. He is the person that's supposed to be making sure everything's safe at the plant. And uh, there has been multiple instances throughout the show where he does things that are just super stupid, super reckless. And um, one of these is actually starting at the very beginning of the show in the intro, which is in every single episode up until season 32 when they ditched the uh, intro. And it shows Homer, you know, uh, leaving work, and he accidentally sticks a plutonium rod in the back of his shirt as he's leaving. And then later in the intro, he takes it out of his uh, shirt as he's driving and then, you know, haphazardly throws it out the window. And it's that kind of a thing which is corroborated over so many different episodes that Homer's just not safe to be around a nuclear plant. And that Mr. Burns, this Scrooge character who's really greedy, just doesn't care at all about nuclear safety. Um, and then, you know... Things like Blinky, the three-eyed fish who uh, was caught in a little pond right outside of the plant where they're dumping the waste into it. And um, it just, there's like a myriad of examples in The Simpsons alone uh, for a bunch of different reasons that, uh, you know, say that nuclear is dangerous and specifically that people aren't fit to handle the responsibility that comes with nuclear energy. Elaborating on the reactor, nuclear energy, side effects, poor reputation... You studied a lot into Godzilla. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the portrayal of energy in the Godzilla movies. You got it. Godzilla is the most loaded of them all. Um, 1945, obviously at the end of World War II, we had the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I think a lot of people see Godzilla and say like, oh, he's you know a metaphor of that. It came out nine years later, this film that's all about a giant nuclear monster attacking Japan. I think that's a reflection of that. But... What a lot of people don't know and what's really interesting is actually earlier that same year, in 1954, before the first Godzilla film came out, there was some nuclear testing in the Pacific Islands by the United States. And outside of the predetermined danger zone, um, there was a Japanese fishing vessel called the Lucky Dragon where a nuclear testing you know, incident occurred and basically they were exposed to a lethal amount of radiation a bunch of fish in the area were contaminated, the well water was contaminated, stuff like that, and a bunch of Japanese people died, and this was basically seen as like the third attack on Japan, uh, a lot of people said. And uh, Godzilla, the very first Godzilla movie, basically, you know, uh, showcases this one-to-one -one with Godzilla himself, although he's not shown uh, fulfilling the role of the nuclear testing where this giant explosion happens, and... Uh, Everything's contaminated. And then further, Godzilla's gone on in subsequent movies after the Chernobyl disaster uh, to directly, um, you know, comment on that kind of stuff and the meltdown. And Godzilla's actually had meltdowns in the movie theaters where his own heart, which is often likened to a nuclear reactor core, goes thermonuclear and he kind of, you know, explodes from the inside in this giant meltdown. And um, Godzilla really has just become a nightmarish depiction of anything nuclear and its potential, uh, you know, most hyperbolic extent uh, to the danger that it could, could potentially hold. As we mentioned earlier, a large part was also based on video games mm -hmm. of your research. And uh, some of that, I assume, is Call of Duty and the Modern Warfare series gets into it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the Black Ops series gets into it a little bit. Um, Metal Gear, the Fallout series. Mm -hmm. What... Tell us a little bit about the video game side of basically the fallout of nuclear warfare and, and how that sure. um, is addressed. The Fallout series is really interesting because it sets itself 
entirely after a giant nuclear holocaust has happened. So all the nukes were launched, the entire world has been scorched, and you basically inhabit this wasteland which is burned beyond repair uh, and inhabited with a bunch of nuclear abominations, which are all out to kill you and all completely ridiculous um, scientifically. There's humans, which are referred to as ghouls, which basically look like walking corpses that are, you know, not killed by the radiation, but survive by it, and some are even healed by it, which is just totally ludicrous in a scientific perspective. And um, in Call of Duty specifically, there's a recurring reward, a medal that you get if you kill uh, 30 enemies without dying yourself, which is really difficult to do. Uh, anyone who's listening who hasn't played it, that's like, you know, super, super difficult to do. If you accomplish this feat, you get a nuclear medal, which only makes sense in the case that, you know, you're called nuclear for having done this amount of, you know, death and destruction. This amazing level of lethality is um, rewarded by saying, hey, you know, you're a nuclear level threat kind of thing. So it, you know, is really a culmination of all of these different elements in this one medal in Call of Duty that says, hey, you're the most dangerous thing out there. You're a nuclear thing. Is this where you went from this is going to be a two-hour research project to <laughs> much longer because you decided to pick like three 60-hour games and a, few, a bunch of campaigns that are at least 10 hours each? Yep. Uh, <laughs> those The video games took me a while to uh, complete. The Simpsons was the longest thing that I was like, oh, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch some Simpsons. And then it was like, man, there are so many very quick anecdotes which are such beautiful examples. And it really became... Uh, you know, watch almost the entirety of The Simpsons, which is more than, you know, uh, I think 20. It's a lot. It's a lot. I don't have the exact number, but watching all of The Simpsons was a really long time. Um, but I, you know, I searched up some specific things that I knew I wanted to get to, and I watched insofar as certain moments. And um, But a lot of the video game things, actually, the examples came from things that I knew could happen, like the nuclear metal. I'm ashamed to say during my playtime I didn't get a single nuclear medal, but, um, you know, I tried, and so there you go. There's plenty of YouTube <laughs> videos. You could see what happens. <laughs> yes. Yep, definitely. Thank you for that great recap of your research. I want to go back to your theater experience. Sure. Here at PC. You wrote a play in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yep. You Zoom to produce the play. Mm -hmm. I, I watched it yesterday. It's a really insightful play about high school students confronting racism mm -hmm. and the different roles some people play in in a situation that could happen at a high school. What brought that to life? Sure. Um, well, John Garrity, who uh, retired actually just this last year, is one of the most brilliant theater people that I know that I've ever worked with. And he basically, during the pandemic, wanted to showcase new student works. So he had this idea for a writer's summit that was basically going to be any, you know, theater student that wanted to could write a play and we would, you know, do a Zoom production of it. And I reached out to him and asked, hey, could I be the stage manager for it? Because, you know, I would get to have the stage managerial experience of doing it over Zoom, doing it with multiple smaller things. I thought that'd be really cool. And he said, oh, actually, I was hoping you would write one of them. And I, you know, I had never thought of playwriting before, but I said, sure, I'll, you know, I'll give it a shot. And the idea for the play itself, uh, activism, uh, kind of came about from my own experiences. I went to a very small high school, East Bay Public High School, the smallest public high school in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and it was a great school, but we were definitely not diverse. And one of the things that I actually talked about with John throughout the whole of writing this play is he was like, I just, I don't feel that some of the premises of this are realistic. And I said, while this did not happen at my school, um, similar things happened at my school. And I had experiences where people were just, you know, really out of touch because there just weren't, you know, there wasn't that life experience. There weren't people that thought or acted that way. And um, to a certain extent, you know, I was like, this, you know, this is realistic. I, I lived this to a certain extent. And, um, the play is all about performative wokeness uh, from, you know, white people preaching to the choir about some of these issues. And as a white person myself, I was like, you know, what story can I tell that would relate to the college's action statement and the themes that we're trying to speak to? And um, 
I, you know, I'm really proud of it. I, I don't want to boast, um, but I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about it. Um, but I, it was a great experience, and uh, I'm really proud of uh, the play itself, and that production especially, directed by John Garrity. How much did your, uh, well, your actors help you in the writing of the play? Uh, two of the actors were my direct roommates, uh, who you might think have had more of an influence on it, but they actually had no influence on it. <laughs> I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, if you guys want to help me at all, if you're any, um, you know, have any ideas or suggestions, and they brought, you know, a level of character to the characters um, in the way that, you know, they embodied them physically, but they basically said, hey, you know, this is your script. I don't want to, uh, you know, overstep. They, uh, they, they liked the script. They were like, I like where you're going with it. They were uh, hands off, and maybe they just, you know, had their own things going on, but I'll take it as the flattery comment, the, the angle they tried to give it with, like, you know, we love it where it is. Don't, <laughs> don't have us touch it, so... So you, be, you were able to produce this over Zoom mm -hmm. entirely. Yes. Which leads us to the last 20 months or so, or 18 months, whatever it's been. Mm -hmm. What were some of those challenges? I mean, a lot of the things you do are really in-person things that you need to be with other people in the same room. You're, you're in the pep band. Yep. Um, you're a theater major. Doing plays is kind of the thing. Yep. So what were some of those challenges and how did you address them? So a lot of the challenges that have been, um, you know, had to be dealt with over the past 20 months or so, uh, the attitude that I tried to take with it is, you know, we're wearing the mask. We're not seeing one another. It stinks. You know, <laughs> like that is not ideal. It really stinks. But I was so proud of all the work we've done. And throughout the whole thing, I would always just, you know, punch my fist forward and say, hey, we're persevering. We're doing art in a pandemic anyways, because in a lot of ways, PC uh, pushed through and did a lot of really great stuff. And I was talking to some of my friends from other colleges, other institutions, and they're like, we're not doing anything. And I was like, that's, that's awful. But we got to start out. I did a radio play with uh, Patrick Saunders, and uh, that was great. Echoes, Voices from the Void, I thought that was great. Um, I got to work on the Writers' Summit, as I mentioned just a minute ago. And then in the spring, we did our big musical. We did uh, Violet the Musical, where there was a lot of technical aspects, a lot of recording in isolated studios, the way that a movie would be shot from the ground up with these different scenes that are then stitched together. And um, I mean, that was crazy. I mean, that was literally, we were standing in different rooms, able to be maskless because we were in different rooms, talking with our you know, scene partners and acting and emoting without seeing the person's face sometimes. Um, and that was just an amazing experience. All of it was just really, really great. Although I will say this year going forward, we've been able to have some opportunities where we don't need to have the masks on uh, outside, especially you get to see more people, be with more people. And that's such a special thing. I mean, I, I can't wait for it to be, you know, hopefully at some point, knock on wood, back to normal. But, um, you know, I was, I was really proud of all the stuff we were able to do over this past year, despite the circumstances. And you mentioned that radio play. We did have Dr. Oberoi and Patrick Saunders on the podcast mm -hmm. uh, in September. So if anyone wants to go back and, and learn how that came about, uh, we did do an episode with them. I listened to it the other night. It was awesome. Great. I loved it. <laughs> um, you also are very interested in travel. Tell me about some of your travel over the years. Sure. Um, I have gone to Disney a lot. I've gone up to the White Mountains in New Hampshire a lot. Um, I went to uh, Canada, Quebec City, a few times in high school. Um, my favorite place I've ever traveled to, though, was actually through the honors program my freshman year. We went to Peru, and we got to go to Lima and Machu Picchu, and we stopped over in Panama. Um, and that was just such an amazing experience. My parents, uh, you know, encouraged me to go my first year, and I'm so glad they did because, you know, my sophomore and junior year didn't happen at all. And this senior year, they're going to Santa Fe, I believe. But, you know, it's not an abroad trip. Um, and I got to go to South America, which is a continent that wasn't one, you know, that I had initially thought that I'd be going to. You know, I want to go see, see Europe, see Asia. But the culture down there was just so amazing. And to actually see Machu Picchu itself, one of the wonders of the world, um, just being in such a completely different environment than I'd ever been in before, it was amazing. 
like that that experience was just absolutely uh, phenomenal in every way. You also have mentioned that you were on the esports team. <laughs> I was on the esports team. Okay, and you played Super Smash Brothers. Who is your main? <laughs> I still play Super Smash okay. Brothers. Um, Sephiroth would probably my friends would say Sephiroth is my main, but I like to play Steve with the Alex alt for you know no surprise there because then the announcer says my name when I win. So. <laughs> All right, just had to get that one in there. Sure. Um, I, I want to thank you for joining me. This has been great. We learned a lot about you, learned a lot about your research. It's, it's been a really fun conversation. Thanks for coming over. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening to the PC Podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including your smart speaker. Episodes are also available on our YouTube page. Please rate and review the show so more people can find the podcast. Again, thanks for listening, and go Friars.